morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfeed Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 495, I believe it is, of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yeah. <laughs> Today, recording day is. Monday, October 21st, 2024, and it looks like it's going to be a lovely day here at the Beaver Lodge. It's also been a weird and interesting day already at the Beaver Lodge. More on that later. I'm your host, the Eager Beaver pronouns, he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A, and uh, not with me, as usual, is my good friend with Mr. <laughs> Grizzly. With me, as unusual, I guess, is my good friend, Mademoiselle Fox. Uh, Mr. Grizzly is um, taken, he, he's on the, the, the entry list today. I'm, I just want to be your arm candy. That's it. Okay. So, 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 how, how's he doing? Is, is it bad? Yeah, he's got, his back is pretty bad. Okay. Um, and, you know, he hates to miss the show. And uh, I just said, you know, could I jump in? Would that be okay with Douglas? And so, um, thank you for having me. I can't wait to hear what you want to talk about. All right. Uh, and uh, thank you, kids and cubs. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> Paul has never looked better. Mr. <laughs> 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 Jim. Oh. <laughs> I love that. I just, I just was about to keep talking, and I just turned my, I turned my head, and out of the corner of my eye, it was right at eye level. Oh my! Your, oh your my. naked body is on the screen. I don't care. <laughs> Honestly, Mister Jim, I almost just peed my pants. Thank you. <laughs> it's breakfast and a show, kids and cubs. <laughs> a show within a show. There you go. Um, <laughs> Okay. Okay. The morning, the morning got more interesting and weirder. <laughs> like, yeah, Paul just life. came on screen like half naked. <laughs> like... <laughs> to fix your your earpiece, that's love. That's love. That is love right there. It is. Uh, and, now, and now we've all seen his chest hair. So. That's okay. And the tattoo that says soup. <laughs> Nobody says you want, did you just get political there? You just start talking about <laughs> For those who have no idea what we're talking about, you had to be here. <laughs> did, you, did you see what Linda just said? She said, is this, is this only fans? Oh, fans. <laughs> Angry Red Speedo Man rants the, the, the teaser. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, I think... I got to a big thank you goes to our podcast for having sponsors. <laughs> We're already <laughs> off the rails. The Pepper Master, the Miss V Mysteries from Quarterly Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Uh, 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 Fox, how's your mental health doing today? You know what? I'm in a, 
a fantastically good mood. I don't know why, but I, I'm like, I had a good sleep. Uh, I, I get to be on your show and, um, I got nothing else. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a happy woman. Okay. How about you? How are you doing? Your happiness makes me happy. Thank you. How are you um, doing today? I am, how about it? Overall, I am doing kind of well. Uh, you know, uh, on Friday night, I went to uh, Montreal to go see my favorite, uh, Cindy Lauper, like in concert. She has said that girls just want to have fun, um, aka girls just want to have fundamental rights. Did she do true colors? Or, of course she did. Of course she did. Um, and uh, she's 71, number one. She looks great, still performing like a beast. Like going from side to not not just standing one place, like going from side to side on the stage and costume changes and the whole the whole bit. Um, she can, you know, she can hold a note, and 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 she can still hold a note at seventy one. Apparently, she's still taking vocal lessons pretty much every day. Still, um, she she can she hits all the notes. Uh, I mean, everything was just absolutely fantastic uh, about the show, and it's her last last tour. Oh, okay. She's 71. Uh, you know, I don't know if she'll do a Vegas regular residency or something at some point, but, you know, her last tour and her very first tour, which is like when I was like all of like 11, I think, and it's like I like made my mom buy tickets. <laughs> right? I have a question to ask you about Cindy Lauper, and you'll know this better than I because of your theater background. Um, did you ever, see, I saw Kinky Boots in Chicago. Oh, which yes. she produced, I think. Did she produce it? She, uh, she wrote uh, the, the the music. The like she yeah. wrote all the songs. Stuff. Okay, That's she won a Tony for that. She was the first woman to win a, win a Tony alone. Really, for doing that ever? Yeah. I like. I was. My mind was blown. Like it was. It, it's really good. The movie itself is pretty good. If you haven't seen it, I haven't. Because like the movie itself is pretty damn good. But uh, yeah, no, that that was that musical really rocked, and she's working on another one called Working Girl that should be opening at uh, some point soon. Um, but it was the it's also Montreal was also the first night of the entire tour, right? So we're the first to see it. So she was fresh and full of energy, I'm sure. Fresh and full of energy, all that good stuff. So um, I don't know. I'm oh, that's true. I don't have sound, so I can't show it. Darn. Uh, but, uh, okay, well, then it doesn't matter, actually, because the sound may get me into trouble. Um, but Kits and Cubs, uh, yesterday, uh, there were friends of mine that were at the concert in other sections, you know, and you're on Facebook, hey, I'm here, too, I'm here, too, and all that kind of stuff. And, um, well, something happened the day after. So uh, you will not get a sound for this, but you will see the video portion of it. Now, so, Cindy Lauper uh, put out a video itself saying that the show in Toronto for last night still had some tickets with some video from the Montreal concert. And they have all the music playing. And listen, like, this place is full, right? We're at, uh, we're at the Bell Centre in Montreal. So everybody's singing, everybody's laughing, everybody's having a good time. The show was great. Uh, all the songs that you expected to be there uh, were there. Then a couple of others, uh, of course. Um, but it was just a loving, right? People dressed for the occasion. They had the, you know, the 1980s sort of like tutu skirts and all that kind of stuff. And the colors in their hair or just wigs, the, the, the pink wigs and blue wigs. And look who's there. Right there. Ah. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, oh my god. It's like, like you have to understand, right? Everybody has the first artist that they really like go crazy for, mm. or they put the posters on the wall, right? The very first one, first one that the concert, first live, you know, not concert at your local fair, but that you actually like paid a ticket and you actually went to an arena or a studio or traveled for or something like that, you know, like your first role. This was it. Was Cindy Lauper and the Bangles opened. So here I am. I'm like, sorry, the the Bangles the, opened? The Bangles opened. 
I just had a bangalgasm. Like, what? Yeah, it was a great tour. It was a really great tour. Uh, so here I am now. I think I was 11 when this when the concert came. Because 40 years later, I made a video with Cindy Lauper. You're a little bit famous. <laughs> the for, unfortunately, we did not get to meet because that would have been really cool. Uh, but oh my god. <laughs> It's like my, my, my life is complete. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's just, as a fan, that's kind of a, a weird thing to happen. Honestly, I'm, I'm like, blown What away. are the odds I that don't out know. of all the people in the whole stadium, like this, there'd be, you could clearly see me. And I mean, I'm sure that's the same for everybody that, that's in there who's like faces you got to see clearly, right? It's like, oh my God, they're probably freaking out the same way. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to tap out because par- par- people in the chat are saying that the sound is off. Oh. So I'll, I'll ask Paul if he can fix it, okay? Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, that, might, that might be a my end thing at Kits and Cubs as well because uh, the show is producing f- uh, via my computer uh, today because, uh, um, yeah. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that, that, might, that might be me. I need to unplug my mic. Okay. So it's Paul. All right. Paul's, he's on, he's trying to fix the sound right now. Well, just, I know we have a little bit of uh, quiet right now, but um, um, Carol Carol lost a cousin. I just want to say sorry about that. It's a big loss. Thunder Bay. <clears throat> Sick for a year. Didn't tell anybody. So. Apparently, I have my headphones, earphones. <laughs> um, oh, Jesus. I can't. No, no, no. All right, there's a, pri- there's a message in private chat. Can you tell him? You're on the microphone. Yes. Well, I can't hear Douglas. Nobody can hear Douglas. 
excuse me. Um, yeah, okay. Well, Fox has sound, so I'm... Um, there he's good. All right, take it away. There, there you go. Hey. You're back. Awesome. I was trying to get your attention. <laughs> you guys I'm, got no, I, I saw end. you. I saw you, but like, I don't know. Paul just fixed it. You know, um, yeah, yeah. math is hard and technology is hard, and I'm not good at either of them. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. It's because I, I had put it put in the private chat. Have you guys got me muted on your end, and nobody was nobody saw no, it. No, no, we didn't. I, I we saw it. I just I didn't know how to fix it. I'm like I'm like the the poor man can barely get off the couch. I'm like, can you fix it? <laughs> All right. All right. Take, uh, take it away. Did the uh, jeez. Uh, so, uh, uh, listeners, is the sound better at your end? Or is it still? Because I'm still seeing Fox's sound is clipping too. It's all distorted, but whatever. Doug is good. Fox is clipping. Okay. Well, uh, how about I just I'll just listen and and then I won't clip out. I'll just said I don't know what the fuck is happening. Okay. I'll I'll just like. Are you going to talk about Susan Holt? I hope so. Uh, a little bit. Okay, I'm just gonna listen till I get my sound fixed. Okay, dokie. All right. Um, so uh, I'm not sure how much anybody understood <laughs> what we've been talking about for the last 17 minutes. So uh, how about uh, I do uh, the intro again, and um, Mr. Grizzly, just uh, when you do the audio, just clip out all of the opening because this would be weird for people to listen to all right so i'll give myself a little countdown and uh we will try it again still the same everybody's saying douglas is good mademoiselle is clipping both are scratchy clipping is happening to both of you yeah then it's probably something from my uh probably something from my computer okay kids and cubs uh because paul's got uh, uh the better one for broadcasting okay doke it's still messed up but listenable Okay. All right. Uh, so it's still broken. Okay. Well, good morning and hello, kids and cubs, and welcome to season four and episode number four hundred and ninety-five of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Crying Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day is Monday, October 21st, 2024, and it is going to be a pretty nice day here at the Beaver Lodge. I'm your host, the Eager Beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, hey. Not with me, as usual, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. He's taken a personal day, bit of a bad bat. Is that right, Mademoiselle Fox? Uh, there we go. I'm having a little technical difficulty, but I think I should have resolved it right now. There you go. No, I have not. Now I cannot hear you. <laughs> oh, my word. Okay. Kits and Cups, it has been a very, very, very weird morning here at the Beaver Lodge. Now I can't hear you. There you go. Oh, I'm back in. I'm back in. Yes, we're whoop, back in. Whoop, whoop. There we go. <laughs> Nobody mutes the fox. I'm just kidding. Yeah, there we go. I should be muted like half the time I speak out loud. <laughs> no, please. Jeez. Oh, all right. So, um, not with me as always is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly, who's having issues with his back. And uh, so we have Mademoiselle Fox, unusually with me. But hey, bring in some sunshine here to the Beaver Lodge. Uh, <laughs> how's your mental health doing today? Um, I am, I feel like really good. I feel well rested. I feel happy. I feel optimistic about the world. I don't know what it is, but I'm, I'm, I think it's the sunshine. I'm, I'm grateful for uh, feeling this way today. Ah, excellent. I'm glad, I'm glad. Um, I'm in a good mood overall. I'm a little sleep deprived because that BC election thing. Yeah, you were up really, you watched the whole thing, eh? I watched the whole thing. So I was up till three and then uh, I had a, 
there's a time where you're tired and then you sort of like get a second win. So I was in the middle of the second win. So I was up until about uh, uh, six or so. So and uh, I did not catch up yesterday, but yesterday we went on a beautiful um, nature walk in a little uh, Cataraqui Creek cons- conservatory area and enjoyed the fall colors and awesome. lived with mm-hmm. nature a little bit. So um, that did muscle some good. Um, now, when I'm saying it's a weird morning, kids and cubs, uh, it's um, something very strange happened. Um, there's something going on with our neighbors to the left and the neighbors to the right of us. <laughs> oh well, I know one. I know one set of neighbors. What happened? I want to know. So, so we're caught between. Well, the neighbor to the right of us really does not like the neighbor to the left of us at all, and has it for a long time. And the neighbor to the left of us, actually grew up in our house and then moved next door, you know, when his parents bought a house next door, I think, because I guess they needed something a little bigger and he's inherited that one. Um, They do not like each other. Now, our uh, neighbor to the left, yes, uh, has some guests over and they have dogs and um, yeah, a big dog, if I remember correctly. Yes, yes. Yeah, a but, big, kind of scary looking dog. Yes, but the, mm. who, who's like not dangerous at all. She's a little, she's a big old chicken, but barks loud, but she's a big old chicken. Now the, but they've got dogs of their own that are of the same kind, same breed. And um, they're letting them out to pee yeah, past midnight and way before seven, and the dogs, as soon as they're out, start barking. So That's the neighbor cool. to the right has some type of strobe light in his lower window that he's started flashing at night to try and disturb them, I guess to try to get them to go away. But the strobe light bounces on our fence right outside our bedroom window. So it was like a disco. And the intended effect that he wants is not actually getting to them. Like if I wanted to go to a disco, I would go to a disco. I don't want to be in my room and have a disco. Yeah. Yeah. And the neighbors to the right of us have the dogs. So this morning, as I was getting ready, Mr. Riggers let me know. He was not going to do the show, so I was coming to do the programming. And um, he was taking notes for the show. And I go do that uh, you know, outside the house because my beaver sweetie is still sleeping. And when I want to listen to stuff on a speaker, so you know, don't want to wake him up. And uh, as I'm packing stuff to come in to start the show, I hear um, sort of like a vuvuzela sound. <laughs> Did you just like, say vuvuzela? <laughs> yeah, vuvuzela sound. Like this, this horn, or like you know, when the sports horns when you go to see a football game, you go like this, that type of sound really, really loud. So much that as I'm gathering my stuff, like that stuff in my hands, and I almost dropped it, I was like, What the? Fuck? Because and as I am saying, What the? Fuck, I turn around, and my beaver sweetie is right there. So I was like, Ah, this is a horror <laughs> movie, right? It's like, you scared the shit out of me. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, like this, and of course, he's trying to sleep, so he's upset with it, so it's like, okay, it's like, don't be upset, and try to calm him down, it's like, yeah, just, just go back to sleep, you know, just, you know, tuck him in, nice little kisses, and, you know, it's like, don't think about that stuff, just think about that I love you, that's what you think, just, just go back to happy, sleepy, bye-bye, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> and I why you'd be such a... You'd be, you're such a good uncle and such a good parent. You'd be such a good parent. Like, just like, quiet time now. Go back to bed. <laughs> Put down the phone. Put down the phone. Don't, don't start looking at the phone because you haven't gotten enough sleep yet. That's not going to help you. Just put down the phone. I can't sleep now. That's like, put down the phone. <laughs> Happy sleepy bye bye time. <laughs> so, here's, some, here's some ether. <laughs> trust me, that would be way more efficient, but apparently that's illegal. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's illegal to drive people to sleep. Yes. I appreciate that and I follow those rules. But I very much appreciate the direct effectiveness, I have to say. 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I didn't think I would be doing all that before I started the show, but there you go, uh, Douglas. Um, wow, I really can't understand what Douglas is saying, says Kit PNC Bio. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, gee, I, I hope the audio for it. Uh... I can hear you perfectly, but I don't know. P okay. PNC, are you on the road? Interesting. Okay. Know. So, yeah, that's uh, all the stuff that has gone on this morning. Um, just weird. Really weird. Things have been very weird for about two and a half weeks. Honestly. I mean, but, yeah. like, the, the show's disappearing. Like, this, the, the glasses vanishing from the top of my head. Like, this, when I didn't run, I didn't jump, and I was outside for all of, like, 7.4 seconds. <laughs> it's just uh yeah th th you know it's a, really it's a full exactly. it's a full moon so i think there's something about that yeah because i've been a little bit cuckoo bananas this week as paul could tell you like okay. but there's, there's something about the full moon like it's a thing the emergency rooms get quite full oh yes fuller when there's a, a full moon and um yeah it's a thing mm. All right so, uh, wow, where to start? Um, we've had lots of elections. There are lots of elections. Um, Friday was, no, Saturday, sorry, it was. Uh, there were elections in British Columbia. Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry, there was a kid comment there uh, that I thought was addressed to, well, was addressed to me, but anyway. Um, so uh, we had BC elections on Saturday night and on Saturday night we also had municipal elections throughout the province of Nova Scotia um, so if we start with the most important news it's the municipal elections from the province of Nova Scotia because we had a kit who was doing democracy Kit Saucy was running for the town council of the town of Lockport and um, unfortunately, she did not uh, get a seat on council. Next time. Uh, Next but time. She did get 37% of the vote, which pretty much rocks. Because for first time out, 37% of the vote is quite, quite, quite good. So, um, Congratulations on uh, doing such a good job. Uh, congratulations on getting involved, regardless of the result. We are very, 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 very proud of you. And uh, yes, indeed. That was a, uh, uh, and the, it, it seems that um, Saw, Kit Saucy impressed enough. Oh, there we go, Kit Saucy. People are asking me to run next time, so don't worry. There you go. So impressed enough that uh, it looks like she's got something to build on and uh, perhaps, perhaps may be get a tap on the shoulder at some point during the next few years to lead something because it seems that uh, there was a change in the mayor's seat as well, if I am uh, not mistaken. Get Saucy can uh, let me know that. And uh, the, the new mayor is uh, quite impressed. So, could be the beginning of something good. I don't know okay. if you, if, if you just, I just wanted to say to, to Mo, in Ontario, she'd have a majority. Yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, there is someone in the green room, and I can't tell. Okay, this is very strange. Oh, Mr. Mateo! Oh, oh, it's Mateo's yes. birthday, yes, right? Yes, it's my birthday, yes. Happy birthday. Yes. Happy birthday to you. Hello, my friend. Aren't we, ah, aren't ah, we lucky? Ah, Look ah, at ah, you. Ah, 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 ah. How are <laughs> you? <laughs> oh, happy birthday to you, my friend. How are you doing today? Good. You're doing good? How old are you now? Six. No. <laughs> 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 <laughs 
788.7. That's a lot. <laughs> you see yourself on the TV. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you going to have some cake today? Cupcakes. Cupcake. Oh, now that is very, very special cake, cupcakes. Here, let's let's show your beautiful decorations. What you woke up to? Oh, oh my! Look at that cupcakes <laughs> in the banner too. And we've got banner over here as well. I got to show you my Lego build. Oh, oh. I'm sorry. He wants to show you his Lego build. Hold on, oh. Lego. Like, can we talk about Lego? Lego is the best. Oh, my. oh wow! So nice. That Lego is really good. good. You did a great job. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's more creative than I ever did. With Lego. <laughs> He's a Lego master. <laughs> wow. That's impressive. One, two, three, and five. Two, two, two. You gonna shield. Two, you going to talk, buddy, before you get back and distracted? <laughs> oh, my two Can we talk about That's Lego? Nice. Like, when, when, a, when a piece goes missing... Like my 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 big kid loves loves Lego, and when the, when a piece goes missing, he would he would lose his marbles. He'd be like, "Where did it go?" It, we call the the Lego freak out. <laughs> <laughs> Mateo does it where he's building something and it falls apart, then he has a meltdown. <laughs> gotcha. Understandably. <laughs> oh man. So what are you looking for? I love Lego set today. You're going to build another one? Yeah, today. Yes. That's good. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm so happy for you. Listen, happy birthday. I hope it's a good one. It is. Thank you. It is? Are you going to have a party? No. No, COVID got us and we postponed a party. Oh, yes, that's true. How are yeah. you feeling, little man? Great. <laughs> I'm feeling great. Okay. Yeah. That's the important part. I don't have COVID anymore. You don't have COVID. Well, then that's a good reason to feel great, right? And you know what? You, you made everyone's day really special. <laughs> and we're, we're glad you're feeling well. Give them a big smile so you know you're missing teeth. <laughs> 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 Milo! They, they, they come back. Don't worry. Hi, Milo. Yeah, he's so big now. Oh, my God. What a cutie. <laughs> All right. I'm giving you a big, big hug, Mateo. Say thank you. Big, deeper hug. Oh. <laughs> mm. Have a happy birthday. Oh, thank you, miss. <laughs> Say happy ber belated birthday, Danny. His birthday was two days ago. Okay, happy belated birthday, Dan. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Get back to your show. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for having us. Uh, that's so lovely. Oh, oh, I was like... oh. oh, my God. Yes, Mateo's sound is clear, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that was too uh, much adorable. Girl. That's ridiculous. Yeah, he's so handsome. He is. He's the cutest. Oh my god, I love that. Oh man. Okay. So we had uh, some. So yes, uh, Kit Saucy. Um, we are we are very very proud of you, and uh, we know that this is the beginning of something good. Uh, yes, as mentioned, uh, it was Kit Dan's birthday as well on the nineteenth. So happy belated birthday, my friend. I hope it was a fantastic one, and. Um, You've got some debates coming up, I believe, uh, that you, uh, you announced. So uh, wishing you all the best for that. Uh, keep uh, fighting the good fight, my friend. All right. Uh, we had a BC election special. Uh, for those of you two who turned in, uh, good. Uh, one of our original kits, Adam McGillivray, out in BC, uh, joined me for that one and uh, provided some excellent co-commentary. Uh, he had. Uh, participated in a few election campaigns in terms of helping to organize and stuff and had even run for a city council seat a few times. I think at once, maybe. I'm, I might be wrong on a few times there. 
uh, but at least once. Um, so uh, he was able to bring us some good um, pro promise on the ground insight as to about certain candidates and winners and incumbents and that type of stuff. Uh, added a lot to the show. Um, so thank you so much, sir, for having participated. Looking forward to working with you again uh, and uh, maybe try to create some pretext for it to happen because that was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, we have a, how would I put it? I am wondering how the hell it could be so close considering the two campaigns we saw, right? So right now, as it stands, uh, it's uh, the BC NDP has 46 seats. The BC Conservatives have 45 seats. The Greens have two seats. The Greens' two seats have been confirmed. It is 47 seats for a majority. So we're in a situation right now where the Greens could offer their support to the Conservatives, which brings them to 47, or the Greens could offer uh, their support to the New Democrats, which would give them 48. So both of them would be in majority territory there. Now, it would appear that the Greens don't have too much in common with the BC Conservatives, given that BC Conservative leader John Rusthad pretty much does not think that um, um, climate change is an existential crisis. So I'm not seeing very much terrain d'entente for the Greens with the Conservatives, given oh, that you, policy position. Um, can you tell me what that French word was? That's not one I'm familiar with. Uh, uh, um, a, a, a ground to have a mutually, uh, mutual understanding. Oh, okay, cool. Right. You, know, you know I love it when you speak French. I'm like, ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so it looks pretty much like it would be a green NDP thing which is not new to British Columbians because they had that in 2017 when there was another close race. And then I think it was Andrew Weaver, who was the leader of the Greens, a very respected gentleman. Um, and uh, they had a confidence and supply and confidence agreement that worked for the time until it didn't, right? Um, just like it was happening federally. Um, so there'll probably be another supply and confidence agreement um, but there are a few seats that are too close to call yet. And uh, so that is not clear. And officials are thinking that it'll take probably until October 26th or so to kind of finalize that. Um, there's about 1.5% of ballots that have not been counted yet. Um, some advanced, uh, some mail-in ballots and other types of stuff. And in some writings that, you know, the number of ballots could be enough to make the difference. There's one writing, I think the difference is 26 seats and that 26 votes and another one is 53 votes. Um, so once all of those are counted, um, any electoral district that has a discrepancy of 100 or lower uh, could have a, uh, well, will have probably a legally mandated manual, ma manual recount uh, to check that. Um, and then um, there's also the opportunity for requests, judicial requests, or to have other types of recounts for totals over 100. But those uh, 100 or lower, I believe, or lower than 100, uh, will have one pretty much automatically. Um, the election turnout could have been affected by a storm there was a huge atmospheric river that kind of uh, settled in on the day of the vote uh, which dropped up to 233 millimeters of rain in certain places so more rain that has gotten in a in a month and then some uh all within the space of a uh, few hours um it seems that uh elections bc was able to be nimble enough and offer people the uh, opportunity to vote at any uh, polling station and then have uh, you know make sure that elections bc uh, directs that vote uh, to be tabulated uh, at the right place so they were uh, hopefully a lot of people um did not get too affected uh, with uh, their right to cast the vote because of the weather but it was uh, pretty 
bad weather. I mean, whenever you get over 230 millimeters of rain in a short period of time, that's that's a lot to deal with. I mean, there's no city that's a that has a drainage system or you know storm system equipped to handle that. Um, so, uh, you know, it was it was tricky to to do that. But it seems like I said the, the electoral body was nimble enough. Um, the, prelim the preliminary voter turnout was 57.141%, which you'd think would have been very much higher considering how close the election was. But it seems that uh, there is a significant portion of people who chose the couch when it comes uh, to this specific election. Um, right here. The um, votes, votes share was also uh, very close. The BC NDP picked up 44.6% of the votes, and the Conservative Party picked up 43.57% of the votes. So the difference in vote share was 1.03. That was it. So again, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking to myself, how, how the hell is it possible, considering that John Rust had was a completely unserious candidate and the platform was utterly ridiculous and the campaign was the guy brent chapman who called muslim people i think inbred ticking walking human ticking time bombs or something like that got elected after saying that and after that like that he got elected like with, there was only two people in that race, but like with over sixty-five percent of the vote, sixty percent of the vote, he got elected. I, I, I don't. For the Canadians that are out there thinking, you know, whatever's happened in the United States can't happen to here because Canadians are better than this. You might be a little overconfident because this is way too damn close. For the two visions, one party, in all intents and purposes, disqualified itself. And still it got that amount of support. It wasn't, this party wasn't even a real thing 14 months ago. There is something going on. There is something going on. You can't ignore this. Like now, the NDP will turn around and say, you know, getting 44% of the vote is the third highest tally percentage of vote in BC history for, the, for an NDP win. So it's a solid win. They had solid support among the people who voted, but only 57% in vote. 57% voted. If you, got, if you say they got 44% of that 57% of the vote, more people voted for the couch than did for any of these two parties. That's sobering. With one of them so wholly unacceptable. Still, people weren't motivated to come out more to stop that because they sure as heck was motivated to get out to make it happen because a 44.6 is the third highest vote share for an NDP victory in BC history. 43.57, 1.03% less has got to be among the highest for a party that hasn't won. also in BC history. There is something going on. This is way, way too damn close for what we saw. I mean, if you watch Steve Boots, What the Hell Canada show special on BC, there's a part at the end because where he goes through all the things in order that came out about all the people. There's a lot. It wasn't just this Brent Chapman guy. 
that compared stuff to stuff and made these weird statements about and the whole range of stuff vaccines rainbow people women's rights muslims there there were very few targets that weren't touched when you look at the assembly the gathering together of all those comments And despite all of that, 43.57%. Now, either there is a bigger portion of Canadians who truly do support that type of thing, or Perhaps if you are a progressive or centrist party continuously running on while the other guy is unacceptable while not coming to the table with a very serious offer. For people to select is not doing you much good. Um, Carol has a, a really good point. And why are Americans so much better at this than us? They go out like ants at a picnic and like people will stand in line for hours, like eight hours to cast a vote. I walk in, I walk out of my local community center. We make it so easy. And it's like, it could not be easier. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I, I've got I've got no notes on that. I have I have nothing to. It's oh, it's well. a question I've wondered. I mean, like, would I wait? Honestly, would I wait for eight hours? Good morning, Dan. Thank you. I'm noticing my hat. I'm wearing the wrong brand. I should be wearing a Cryer Media Network hat. Sorry. Ah, okay. okay. Um, I, I I lost my thread, but um. Uh, based yeah. on Carol's co comment, that you were talking about people lining up to vote in the United States. Yeah, like if I had to wait for eight hours to vote, I would walk away. And uh, I love democracy. <laughs> and, you know, but I'm like, I don't have eight hours to wait in line. You know? Hmm. I'm trying to think when... So the last U.S. election had a voter turnout of 66%. And I think, which is still low-ish. Um, and ours in uh, 20, uh, 2021, the last one, we had 62.6. So we're, we're in, in similar ballparks. Uh, but it, it, it was down. The election before was 67%. And before that, we had 68.3%. And uh, that 68.3% we had, the first election that brought uh, Trudeau in, was the highest uh, than we had highest since 1993 which was the, the big election where everything uh, blew up parliamentary wise where the the bloc québécois became the opposition party and the reform party i became, forgot about was, that yeah was its whole thing with 55 and whatnot so you know of course that would be a, a lot of participation in that one because it was a revolutionary election that's when we went from being essentially a, a three-party uh, government to now a government, a parliament to a government to a parliament that routinely has five parties uh, represented. Um, even if like some parties are just one or two seats, but you know, routinely uh, five parties. Uh, so that was a big election. But uh, before that, in 1993, uh, most elections like this were over 70%. There's a 90 pound dog that's about to crawl on my lap. Just like, <laughs> pardon me, <laughs> pardon me, everyone. I had to uh, sneeze. Um, but before that, uh, all the election, pretty much all the elections, save three between 1930 and 1993, had a voter turnout of over 70 percent. So something has happened, and the the last one, 2021, was the second third lowest, fourth lowest, I see, fifth lowest. So yeah, among the five lowest in Canadian history. So um, the, the Americans, 
I guess, you know, have a little bit uh, better than, than us. Of course, last time, you know, there was a big motivation to get out to 66%. So, I mean, if it got up to 66% with that, uh, but even then, see, that's what I mean. It was Trump Biden. Did you want a second term of Trump? And even though, even that was only, only got out 66%. Like one third of the nation didn't find that matchup important enough to come up and support either side. But the part that I find concerning to me is like the side that actually wants the Constitution to remain the Constitution didn't show up. So, yeah, 57 is is low. It's definitely low for a provincial election where the stakes were that high and where one of the options was completely unacceptable. So, um, unfortunately, we do not have a clear result yet. It's still too close to call. Um, and uh, like I said, October 26 appears to be the target date by which uh, hopefully stuff will be finalized. I'm not sure if this means that um, the hand recounts for the seats where there was a difference of 100 or less happen in this intervening time or if they have to wait until the 26th for that to happen because there are the other uh, the mail-in votes and whatnot. The mail-in votes is, uh, at least in BC, um, I think that they had to be mailed by the election day and not in by election day. That might be it. So there might be still see, be some coming in. So they have to wait till, you know, the mail in period when it can't be possible for a letter that was mailed somewhere in the province to not arrive in the regular mailing day times so that they can actually make sure they have all the votes to count. So that's a, a bit of the reason of the delay there. Um, the other thing that happened uh, unfortunately, is that the leader of the BC Greens, Sonia Firstino, lost her seat. Um, not because she didn't perform well, as she did. She picked up about 34% of the vote, but uh, there were some electoral boundary changes, and she rode, uh, ran in a seat um, that was different than the one she had before. Uh, and in that seat, she was running against an incumbent cabinet minister um, who was re-elected. Um, so I have, don't, don't get the impression because I haven't seen any articles yet that she, uh, stepped down as the leader of the Green Party. And I hope she doesn't because she ran an exceptionally good campaign, uh, had the most detailed platform to offer people. The conservatives like basically ran something on like two, two pages and said that here, you know, just a couple of days before they voted, but uh, the Greens had like an sort of like 84 page, like really, really thick, detailed with actual like plans, how we are going to get there uh, type of platform. Uh, a lot of it was interesting to a lot of people. So, you know, you should really read this and take a look at this. Costing wise, you know, how much it would cost to put it in was, was a question as it often is. Um, but the ideas were pretty solid. And it, there's a lot that some parties could steal from it if they wanted to actually do some good policy. Uh, and she acquitted herself really well during the debate and throughout the campaign. Uh, you know, she ran against an incumbent minister who was popular so um, and still picked up 35, 34% of the vote. So there's no cause for her to step down. Hopefully there will be a by-election at some point just so she can uh, run there. Uh, but uh, she, she did nothing but do herself and her party's brand good during this election. So this is kind of a a sad and a bit, bit if you could say, like life is unfair uh, type of result. Not the election was unfair, but you know, life is unfair where you had a writing with two clearly very deserving, very qualified candidates that had both had a lot of public support, but there was only one seat. What can you do? Uh, so a, a quality candidate is not in the legislature uh, at the moment, uh, but hopefully there will be an opportunity. Uh, and in the meantime, she can do some work on that, building the party and uh, supporting uh, the two uh, MLAs who have been uh, reelected. And, and their seats are completely confirmed. There's no recounts needed, whatnot. So they do have those two seats. So it is clear that if the results remain the same with the Greens 
have just become the most powerful political party in British Columbia. And everyone is wondering if at this time they will extract a shift to proportional representation uh, through their supply and confidence agreement. Um, there's part of me that sees a situation that that, that that won't work for them because if we look at these, if the vote was this way in a proportional representation system, the Greens would have seven seats rather than two. But the other two parties would have fewer and both of them would be further away from being able to have majority. So I could see a situation where neither of these parties will want to do that. Right? And, and it's like and the NDP could turn around and say, well, the Green says you need to do this. The NDP says, well, we don't want to do this. And it's like, who are you going to run to, the Conservatives? Really? I don't know if you would agree, but uh, like, you know, and I, I, I'm an endeavor big time, but I think the Greens are so ethical that they would sacrifice themselves to bring in proportional representation. Oh, I would, but the Greens don't have to, right? It's the NDP, right. the NDP and the Conservatives that would have to yeah. at this point. So and right now we're in a situation where the Greens are the only party that, of the three parties, are the only one that would benefit seat-wise. Mm -hmm. They were taking these results. So I can, and I don't see the conservatives signing on to that. So there's no threat of telling the NDP, you know, if you don't do this, then I will go and support the conservatives because the green and the conservative mix is not going to be good both on the environment and on this issue. I can also see a scenario where David Eby goes, hmm, 46, 45. That's a whole lot closer than I was comfortable with. A whole lot closer than I was comfortable with. Maybe this would be a good time to move to proportional representation. Make it a little harder for the conservatives to have the majority should they win the next one. Maybe. So I can, I can see both, and I can also see the Greens saying, well, then, if you don't give us proportional representation, like, you know, running to the conservatives isn't our only other move, but let's roll the dice again and go to an election again. Right? That is a possibility. Then the question becomes, that only works if that's an outcome that the NDP are actually afraid of. So again, thinking of the NDP could go 46-45, that was really close. Let's just roll the dice again and make it very, very clear how much unacceptable that they are. And if it's just one more seat, we might do it. Like they could be, mm, you know what? We do have a win now. Let's take the bird in the hand. It's going to cost us proportional representation. But you know what? At least it's a guarantee that we get to run things for the next you know, three or four years. So it's a, it's a delicate balance, right? It's like... The threat of going to a new election only works if that's something that the NDP would find undesirable. And right now, we don't really know. We don't know how Premier Eby and how the caucus is feeling, whether or not, hey, yeah, we just missed it by one, let's roll the dice again, let's be bold, let's take a shot, or, I guess, let's make this work, because a win is a win. If it is indeed confirmed to be a win on the 26th. So, yeah, but there's going to be some interesting negotiations afoot, and if proportional representation comes up, um, like I said, I, I can see a case to argue both. You know, the, the, the leader of the NDP thinking, nope, not, we don't want to do that yet because that's not in our interest seat-wise. That makes it more less likely that we'll ever be able to get a majority again, and we just had one. We just missed here, one here by one seat, so clearly we're close to majority th territory. Why would I give that up, that chance? Chance for ultimate power. Right? Oh, <laughs> Thunder lightning. Right? This, 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 this is the stuff, right? This is the real politic. This is the stuff where pe the, the, that people decide on. As, or, because with proportional representation, we all pretty much know that that means that there's no majority government unless the majority government actually gets 50% of the seats. So that means you're going to have to work together with other parties forever. And ever and ever. And some people really don't like that concept. 
Yeah. Parties that win majorities with 37 or 38 percent now and then really don't like the idea of having to get an extra 12 to be able to have majority power. The parties that have never gotten that really don't like the idea of 38 <laughs> percent, right? So there's a natural tension and tug of war, and you know, depends. And part political parties are private organizations, so they all have their own personal little vested interests there. But like I said, this debate is going because there are some people turning around and saying, you know, if the Greens don't get proportionate how to re representation out of this, they might as well just pack it in and go home. Maybe. But th th there are other things, too. Like I'm saying, that this, is, this could be a central piece of negotiation, and it could not be. But everybody's seeing the opportunity, given that, you know, the, the Greens are the party that, I mean, as much as the NDP says they stand for proportional representation, the Greens are really the ones that have been driving this bus. They're very, very consistent on it from like, the get-go. So um, it's going to be interesting, kids and cubs. More drama to come. There is, and if I may, I don't mean to interrupt you, but Please, I'm gonna know. I'm gonna tap out. Um, oh, okay. And thank you for having me on. Uh, I know I jumped in unexpectedly, so thank you for your okay. graciousness. And uh, I'm gonna watch the rest of the show from Paul's couch. But okay. if I may just say like one quick thing. Absolutely, I was just gonna throw and ask you. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to send Lori Sue some big, big love. She yes. Is, we are so glad that you're part of this community and uh, hang in there, okay. We got you. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me. It was a pleasure. It made my day. Do you have it? Like, do you have anything else? Is there any like thing that the uh, thing that you have on your mind that you want to? Um, share? maybe some words of wisdom. Okay. Okay. Um, be kind. Vote. And don't give up. I like that very much. Okay. Thank you, Love dear you one. Again. Oh, that was all Fox Kids and Cubs. Uh, go Kittle and goes. Have a beyond awesome Monday. That was all Fox. Uh, Daniel Treas, please explain to people what proportional representation means. Thank you, bud. Um, okay. Uh, the To the best of my understanding, uh, proportional representation is a, a voting system because currently we have first past the post where we all vote and whoever uh, gets the plurality of votes. Uh, but not necessarily a majority of them, uh, wins and uh, gets to access the seat uh, as a result of the election. A uh, proportional representation system would be a system that when the votes are cast, uh, we, are, we look at what proportion uh, the electorate voted uh, for the parties. So if the overall uh, vote, like for example in British Columbia, with the overall vote total being 44.6 for the NDP, they would get 44.6% of the seats, or as close as it can be, do, be done right, because we're not splitting seats in half. There'll be some rounding and stuff like that. Uh, the Conservative Party would get 43.57% of seats in the legislature, and the BC Greens would get 8.2. Pardon me, I have to uh, cough again. And therefore, um, there are various ways to uh, achieve this. Um, but it seems that the models that we're looking like in Canada um, would be such that um, we would still have one member uh, per electoral district in the House so that uh, Canadians, like we're with our first pass the post system, if they got something they want with their district, you know, they will go, they, they know who to go to. Uh, but then there needs to be a certain amount of seats uh, in the legislature or the parliament that are used uh, to balance. Um, the number of seats to create the proportionality and uh, those uh, MPs on a federal level or MLAs or MPPs uh, would not be um, representing a specific district from the best I can understand. There might, could, how that is done can happen in many different ways. So I, I can't speculate as to how it would be done in Canada. Um, but there are a certain number of seats that are there that you need there that need to be filled by people that are voted on um, on a different type of a, a ballot list um, to fill those seats. So, I mean, these people are democratically elected, um, but they don't necessarily 
represent an electoral district. So you would have two different, um, not classes, because they all have the same rights, but uh, two groups of representatives that are accountable in different ways, uh, see, seating. Um, that's the part of the thing uh, that's the more difficult to explain uh, to uh, the average person when you're going out and uh, campaigning for proportional representation. Um, because one writing, one MP, you vote for that one is very simple and easy to understand uh, the, the proportional voting system, even though the concept of the number of seats you get is proportional to the vote share that you get is easy to understand how the balancing mechanism uh, is a little trickier to um, to do that. There is also uh, as a and then the other systems that are considered are of course ranked ballot systems, but this one doesn't seem to be too popular in Canada. The movement really is the more organized movement with groups like Fair Vote Canada and the political parties themselves, the NDP and the Greens. They seem to be uh, much more behind a proportional representation system, but there is also other systems called like ranked ballot, for example. Where you just it's it's very similar to what we saw in France with the runoffs. They all voted, and then the top two candidates uh, had ran off against each other, and then there was another vote. So, but instead of having it two votes, it's like an instant runoff in one way. So you rank your ballot, and at one point, eventually, if nobody has fifty percent by the time that there are two left, it does become a run up runoff between the top two, and you've already pre-voted through ranking how you know, what you would like in case there was uh, a runoff. As Kitlin and Emma points out, ranked ballots are what the parties use to elect leaders, ironically. So all the political parties seem to think that it's good for them uh, to organize themselves, but that it's not good for the nation. A lot of people say that, that, that there is an argument in that, that it's, that's the type of vote that would be best structured for smaller um, entities. Uh, and. Uh, not a nation itself. Uh, it's the method that the Prime Minister pre prefers the most himself. Um, his rationale for it is that um, in a ranked ballot system, you are competing to win, yes, but you're also competing to try to be the greatest number of the population's second choice. So that naturally um, in provides incentive for various political parties to compete more for the center than for the fringes, because there are more votes in the center than there are in the fringes, which could depolarize our politics and uh, reduce the possibility of the threat of extremism trying to root itself in our parliamentary system. Uh, because right now, uh, with the adversarial system that we have, uh, we're always looking for contrast and we try to do it by going to the more extreme levels to reduce the voting pool, uh, reduce lower turnout, and bring things down to a battle of the bases. So which party has the bigger and more, more devoted base? Uh, and so you compete for the base, towards the base. So you have policies that uh, uh, and manners of campaigning uh, that give us the type of atmosphere that we have now. Um, so, and in proportional representation, um, even though the composition of the parliament makes it so that parties have to work together uh, cooperatively, not one party will have a majority. Uh, as you see in many countries, uh, there are blocks that form um, that sort of de facto reconstitute the big tent uh, version, except that in this case, you know, any of the parties can pull their support from that at any given time to try to keep the group honest. Uh, but it does create also an opportunity for very small parties uh, to wield, um, that are that could be more extremist, to wield uh, a lot more power than they would, depending if you just, like for example, in the BC uh, situation, if the Greens were an extremist party, for example, and people needed the, their votes, uh, they would have to change a lot of their policies in order to be able to govern. So. These types of things can happen under any system, right? It's just whether or not they're more prone or less prone to happen in some or versus the other. Um, but that's sort of like the, 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 the lay of the land 
um, you know, regardless of the system that you have, whether it's first past the post or ranked ballots or um, uh, proportional representation, uh, you know, it only works so long as everybody agrees that whatever the result that comes in under the system you all agreed to is the result that counts. Um, and everybody takes that in good faith. Then, uh, you know, and, and, you know, a decision like that has to be made fully, fully realizing that there is no such thing as one perfect system. If some people are turning around and they say, if we just do move to this system, everything will be better. Not necessarily. A lot of things will be better in certain areas and might not be as good in other areas as the system you had before, right? It becomes a, a trade-offs, uh, a system of trade-offs. What do you like more? What do you like least? You know, what's more important to have to you in representation? Um, so these are... It, it's not as easy a choice as, you know, vote for this and my party will get more seats because it changes the way that people campaign. It changes the way that people behave. It changes the suite of policies that you might get because what you need to tell people in order to get people to vote for you under a different system with different rules might change. So it, it's not static. It's There's no guarantee that if we changed a system that parties would keep on behaving as they are currently. It might bring some changes as well. And those are the unknowns. Uh, and that's the type of stuff that would make people uh, more resistant to want to vote for that type of change. Um, because, you know, the, the whole expression preferring the devil that you know, you know, we, we might think that our current system is, um, has some lackings, but at least we know how it works and what it does and what to expect as opposed to taking a step in the unknown. So that, that's the up sort of uphill climb that uh, a vote to the whole electoral form movement for those who want some changes face. Um, and then, um, yeah, that's about the, the best I can say with regard to that. Um, but in the, in the situation of British Columbia, there have been, I believe, like three referendum in the past. Um, on the subject matter, and the system hasn't changed as a result of them. So this would be, with the, the Greens having the two seats, would be probably the best opportunity since the last referendum for someone to try to uh, push that through or make a demand or get the, get the ball rolling again on that. And there, there's, a, there's a significant enough portion of the population that wants it to make it an issue, whether there's enough to bring it over the finish line uh, is the question, but it's certainly something that will not be able to be ignored uh, if the people who want this uh, do want it, because the people who want it want it very, 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 very much and are very engaged uh, and uh, have been at it for a while and uh, know how to make it such that uh, they are not ignorable. Like you can't just, uh, parties know that they won't be able to just ride it out. Um, so yeah, there are going to be some interesting dynamics in there. Uh, so hopefully that's, um, uh, hopefully that helps. Uh, I have Mr. Jim here that says, I like a single transferable ballot. And I'm thinking that that's, uh, according to Wikipedia, I just want to make sure I got this one right, is a type of proportionally ranked choice voting. It is, is a multi-winner electoral system in which each voter casts a single vote in the form of a ranked choice ballot. Voters have the option to rank candidates and the vote needs to be transferred according to alternative preferences. Yeah, so uh, personally, that's my preference as well. Um, but I'm trying to keep my personal preference out of my discussion of like, you know, all that's, that's those systems. But uh, I tend to, I, not a big fan of extremism either, and I would prefer a system that forces people to compete for the middle than compete for the fringes as well. Um, so that would be a, that would be my 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 preference. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm I'm not completely sure how I uh, how I feel about uh, proportional representation itself, uh, but I'm definitely interested. Uh, I'm not against it. Uh, but I don't know enough the, how, how lists and stuff would operate to, to balance uh, the system would, ma would matter a lot to me and how accountable those MPs are, uh, something that would matter a lot to me. 
Um, but I like the idea of a ranked ballot, as Mr. Jim Peter says. If I can't have the NDP, I choose liberal, but don't want PC. And that, that's I like it because you can express your full thought: who you want most, who you don't want at all, who you can live with. Um, so it's it's a more full, it's a fuller vote, and there's less need to strategic vote in the sense of voting X first to block O. Uh, it creates a permission structure for everybody to actually vote for their first choice party first because they're voting X to block O can be their second choice, right? Um, so yeah, I, I feel that uh, it would also, you know, our election results would really um, reflect more of the mood uh, of the country. And with that system, um, while parliament would still be such, the, the downside for the people that want proportional representation is that if there's one party that's better at competing to be this everybody's second choice vote then they essentially until another party figures out how to do that better they're essentially government for life because they'll win every time and they'll be able to form majorities uh, like we have now um, but on the other side of it in each individual electoral district you would have an mp in that seat that greater than 50 percent of the electorate in each individual district was that that candidate was either their first choice or someone that people expressed that even if it wasn't their first choice, they could live with, as opposed to the current system, having somebody that win with 37%, uh, representing everyone when 63% of the people in the writing didn't want them or might not be able to live with them. So that's what I mean. It, uh, when I say it's a system of trade-offs, it really is a system of trade-offs. Like if you're, you're getting more of something and less of something else, regardless of the system, and not one of them is perfect. They all have advantages and drawbacks. And you have to look at what's more important, uh, what, what's most important to you and how a country operates, what you think is, is most fair in those situations. So it's, it, it's not, uh, for those of us, uh, those of us who, uh, who really think about it, uh, you know, and what the implications could be, it's a, it's, it's a more, it, it's fascinating and it's intriguing, but it is a more complex situation than if I just, uh, if I, 15% of the vote goes to the NP, they get 15% of the seats. You know, how representation happens, how campaigns are run, the behavior of campaigns, the behavior of parties, how the balancing system, all of these things uh, become questions uh, that you would want the answers to before you buy. Right? So there you go. Uh, so hopefully uh, that was helpful. The other thing uh, going on today, Kits and Cubs, is uh, the New Brunswick elections. They are uh, taking place throughout the province. We have the three main candidates, Blaine Higgs, who is uh, the leader of the Progressive Conservative Party of New Brunswick, Liberal leader Susan Holt, uh, who we've had the good fortune of having as a guest on our show, and uh, the Green Party leader, David Kuhn, uh, whose uh, office we're in talks with actually to have him on after the election. So fingers crossed uh, that we'll be able to chat with him. Um, but uh, they have all run... Uh, their campaigns. Um, voting will start today. I believe that polling stations are already be open in New Brunswick uh, because it is uh, nearly 10 o'clock there in the morning. So I would guess that that is uh, all taking place at the moment. And I'll just look up some information there so I can share it uh, with people who are listening to us here at uh, New Elections New Brunswick site, how to vote. If you're already registered to vote in New Brunswick, you will receive a voter information card and you won't need to show ID to vote. If the information is correct, please call 1-888-858-VOTE. Uh, that might be a little late to do that today, but uh, if, you, uh, if the information is correct, incorrect on your voter identification card, uh, bring with you proof of ID and proof of residence. So you'll need something with a photo uh, that says that you are who you are, and then you'll need something uh, with your address, like a bill or something that says that this is uh, where you live. And with both of those things, you can correct that information right at the polling station. On election day, you can vote in person. Uh, sorry, that's... 
<laughs> goes on election day. You can vote in person or not. Okay. You can vote in person between 10 a.m. and 8 p.m. So uh, that's what I mean. So polling stations are, are about to open then, uh, in about seven minutes. Um, at the, and you could also vote at the returning office today uh, if you can't get to your polling station. Um, if you are homebound due to illness or incapacity or the illness or incapacity of someone in your care, you can contact your local returning office and request a visit from special voting officers. These visits must be scheduled in advance, so it might be late for that. However, if you are having trouble, uh, if you want to cast your vote and you might have some transportation issues, do call um, your, uh, the party of choice, uh, the, uh, their office, because they have a whole teams of volunteers that are there to help you uh, get to the polling station if you need that help in order to be able to cast your vote. So uh, do make those calls. The service is there for you. The parties organize all of that. Uh, if you absolutely need it and you're pressed for time or you have a mobility issue or something and you need someone to pick you up and bring you to the polling station you bring you back home, there are volunteers that will do that. All right, kids and cubs? Um, uh, then to mark your ballot, to vote on your ballot, simply fill in the circle next to the candidate's name. Uh, Elections New Brunswick offers a variety of assisted devices, including Braille and audio and accommodations to ensure voting is accessible to everyone. And there is, uh, there is also um, ASL support available and uh, some uh, potential, potential for curbside voting as well if you need that uh, due to some mobility issues. Uh, but there uh, you would probably have to uh, contact uh, the polling station somehow uh, to be able to get that uh, if you needed to. Uh, on the day if you haven't made those arrangements beforehand. But uh, yes, uh, there you go. Uh, and also, uh, if you do not speak English or French, voters can bring an interpreter with them to help them. Uh, that's uh, also a right that you have. So there you go. Um, it's been an interesting campaign uh, for, the, uh, for the parties. Um, it started off bad for Mr. Higgs, uh, in the sense that there seemed to be a, a gaff uh, a day going on in his campaign, but he seemed to have somewhat cleaned that up uh, over the course of the campaign and um, didn't seem to make too much news. Uh, for, there wasn't big headlines uh, like the route of BC or Saskatchewan uh, with regard to to uh, weird comments or bozo eruptions. Now there was some. I mean, they've got Fatine Grisecci, uh, you know, who believes that uh, it was tells people that she resurrected people from the dead campaigning. So, I mean, it's not that there isn't weirdness going on, um, but uh, nothing that particularly uh, seemed to stand out in a lot of ways in the final days uh, of the campaign. Um, according to polling Canada, the most recent polling in New Brunswick is showing that the likelihood of it being a liberal win would be um, bigger and that the margin has uh, gotten a little wider than it was. Because the last time I had checked uh, with 338, the aggregate itself, uh, the New Brunswick Liberals had a 3% margin, uh, which still showed them uh, having one seat less as it uh, translated into seat counts than the uh, Progressive Conservatives. But them, again, neither of them with a majority, uh, with the Greens, of course, with just a few seats holding the balance of power, very similar to what's uh, going on in BC right now, actually. The, that was, uh, the polls were indicating that that could be the, the type of outcome. Uh, Main Street polling uh, came out uh, with its polling for October 17th, 19th, showing that uh, the New Brunswick Liberals actually have a 10% lead over uh, the Conservatives. So if you see this here, 48 for the Liberals, 38 for the Conservatives, 10 for the Greens, 3 for others, and 1 for the People's Alliance of New Brunswick. Now, that is just one pollster. It's not the aggregate at all on that one. So, uh, and I'm going to just check on the aggregate 
how reliable Main Street is considered uh, on this. Now, the most uh, recent update to the polls for New Brunswick on the aggregate goes back to October 17th. And that's the one where uh, Main Street uh, did publish 4838. And that was followed. So Main Street does have an A minus reputation. So there are, there are some of the better ones. Uh, forum research uh, has come in since uh, with they have a B minus rating, but they also have the liberals at 46 and the PCs at 37. So um, a narrative research, which has a C, oh, okay, in the cities themselves. Sorry, pardon me. Seem to have a, a little tickle in my throat today. Um, the the story that I tried to read to, to you the other day that was behind paywall uh, when I was looking at in the major cities, uh, Saint in Saint John, uh, this was uh, back to October 9th, The Liberals had a lead of two percent, but in Moncton, the Liberals had a lead of nineteen and a lead of eight in Fredericton, according to narrative research. Uh, but their uh, rating is only C plus, so um, you wouldn't necessarily. Uh, take that one to the bank in terms of reliability. Now, in terms of when you add the two new polls, uh, the forum research one and the Main Street one, it seems that the projections from 338 would be that uh, this shows up as a 45% um, to 39% lead for the Liberals which means that the lead uh, went up from 3 to 5%, uh, which means that the liberals would indicate from polling that liberals uh, have momentum going in to the final vote. Um, and if you'll just see this here, I hope that you will be able to see it. I'll show you kids and cubs. Uh, but right here, getting close to the election, right, you see the liberals have the lead and it got really, really tight right here. And just in the last few days, the liberals, whoops, all the way up here. So it's it's in a very short period of time. This is all since uh, October uh, 4th. So in the last 17 days, uh, there seems to have been something uh, that more decisively lot led uh, voters in New Brunswick to be leaning liberal. And it also shows up in the seat projection if 338 is correct. Uh, tonight, we will uh, learn of a liberal majority uh, with getting 28 seats. You need 25 for uh, a majority. And uh, the conservatives uh, dropping uh, to 19 seats. So uh, according to this, uh, since the 4th of October, the uh, PCs have uh, managed to turn things around for the worst for them. Uh, so that they would have six seats fewer than they were projected to have uh, at this point. And it seems that, uh, not sure how many seats they had going into this one, uh, but I will look that up for you to see what a, what a drop uh, that was. But yeah, it looks that uh, Susan Holt, uh, according, now again, Polling is not a predictor. It tells you what people's mood are is in the past. Uh, but based on this, given how close uh, we are uh, to that, as of uh, two or three days ago, it seemed that uh, the liberals had some momentum in uh, the province, and it looks like they might win tonight, uh, which, of course, would make us here at the Beaver Lodge very happy because, as we mentioned, one of our fears. We try not to talk about it too much because we don't want like to fear monger and scare monger. But uh, one of our fears is a uh, Canada that might be led by Pierre Polyev, in which seven of the provinces that have an ideological conservative government and comprise over fifty percent of the population uh, are in place, because that makes uh, a wholesale revision of our constitution and charter of rights. Uh, uh, puts that on the table. Uh, so at present, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island, which is literally exactly seven provinces, 
have an ideologically ideologically conservative government. Now, Quebec's is a little different. Prince Edward Island's is a little different, uh, but they do. Uh, so, for some certainty, we have to flip one more province. Manitoba flipped, and we were hoping that Alberta would flip, but it didn't happen. But if New Brunswick does, and BC does remain in New Democrat and Green hands, uh, that brings them down to six, and that does, at least for the moment, take that off the table. Uh, according to Saucy, though, it seems that we might have one more uh, of these elections because uh, it looks like uh, Nova Scotia is setting itself up to uh, call it call a snap election, and uh, for uh, sometime in November, if I'm not mistaken, Kit uh you might be able to tell me that. Uh, now I'm not sure whether in Nova Scotia, um, what's bringing that on, um, and unfortunately there has not been much polling for the 338 uh, since March 9th actually in there uh, back then it was looking that uh, the the PCs were on their way to uh, uh, a big 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 time uh, majority there so I don't know if he's just looking uh, to secure another mandate before the federal election happens or something but um, yeah uh, I'm not uh, exactly sure what would be um, Premier Houston's motivation to go uh, to have an early election right now, other than uh, if latest polls or his internal seem to be indicating that he's going to cruise to another uh, majority by going now. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when it was he was elected last time, so I'd have to check that out. Uh, yeah, see the most recent poll uh, I see, again, from narrative research, shows so only a C plus rating, uh, but that's from. August 7th, showing that uh, the PCs with a 29-point lead over their nearest rival in the province. So um, that's a lot. So yeah, that might be uh, just what's what's on it, trying to get another one in uh, beforehand. Uh, he's been the premier since 2021. So yeah, he's uh, three years in, or depends on the month of course, but uh, uh, became premier. But about uh, three years uh, into his mandate, there, August, so yeah, a little over three years, three years and a, a quarter into his mandate. So yeah, uh, you know, the, the four years is coming up. Uh, so yeah, you might uh, just be looking for a time uh, that uh, it seems that uh, he is uh, in the lead by a lot. And uh, yes, uh, Kitsasi, the RCMP, just started investigating money that is missing from his campaign, and now an election is called. I am suspicious. Oh, okay. And uh, Houston is pissing people off with doing nothing with health care. He announced that the waiting list for doctors went down to 20,000, but no proof there's also corruption in his campaign team. So there we go. And uh, also from Sasi here, the Beach Center is rented out to Elections Nova Scotia. All the leaders are putting out videos. So uh, yeah, it does look like we will have another one. And before that happens, on the 28th, we will have uh, one in Saskatchewan that I can't tell how things are going, to be totally honest. Um, all the polling information that I was able to check out at 338 was indicating that the Saskatchewan party had opened up um, a pretty sizable lead, a 12-point lead. But uh, Scott Rowe uh, appears to have gone all in on um, the gender identity thing, uh, stating that you know, it would be his first order of business if he was re-elected uh, to go after the trans kids. So that does not give me the impression or a feeling that he believes that he's winning, because if he was winning by a lot, he wouldn't have to go stir that hornet's nest uh, and bring up the controversy that comes along with it, because he knows you've got to get controversy with it. Right? Um, yeah, not sure uh, how that works, to be totally honest, uh, for him, or what that seems to be indicating, why he feels the need to throw red meat at the base uh, and draw the negative attention that comes along with it when everybody knows that's what he stands for and he doesn't necessarily have to be drawing attention to it. 
So that will be uh, interesting. Uh, Carla Beck did get to the better of him in the debate. I didn't get the sense it was that much uh, to get him to panic. And there has been no new polling since. So that's uh, hard to uh, figure out. Excuse me. Um, but yeah, uh, Scott Moe is campaigning a bit like he's, uh, he seems to be a little bit afraid, even though the most uh, recent polling aggregate data that we have shows the Saskatchewan party with a 12% lead. So I don't know if there's something on the ground going on uh, that uh, we here from uh, the center of the universe can't uh, detect. But uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to uh, talk to some people in Saskatchewan and uh, bring you some more information on that soon enough. So uh, remember, New Brunswick, uh, do vote. And uh, Kit Linda, I believe you asked if we will have a watch party tonight. Uh, I did want to do one. I know that Mondays are usually Mr. Grizzly's ASMR, uh, and I was hoping that we could sort of, if he was planning to do it, that we could sort of uh, uh, have him do it at a different uh, hour, uh, which would allow me to come in, uh, because there, I believe, uh, polls close at 7 p.m. Uh, in uh, New Brunswick, but let me uh, just check that to be sure, which would mean um, polls close at 7, that means uh, here uh, Eastern time would be about 8 o'clock uh, that we would start. Uh, no, voters in the province have until 8 p.m. to cast their ballots to help determine which party will govern and whether we'll have majority in the legislature. So yeah, um, if we went on air, uh, it would be around uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 8 p.m. Atlantic Time. So uh, I'm not sure if Mr. Grizzly will do his ASMR given his back um, or not. Uh, and I uh, haven't been able to confirm with him that if he is doing it, uh, whether or not he'd be able to go earlier uh, this evening. Um, so, but yes, uh, do look for it because uh, I would uh, indeed like it to be able to do one. Uh, because uh, this is the one that uh, we have been focusing the most of our attention on uh, this year because we knew it was the province that going into it when we started uh, looking at this at the end of last year, that was the most flippable. So therefore, it would be uh, pretty much on brand for us to actually have something, especially with all the wonderful guests that we've had from New Brunswick come on the show over the last little while to be able to talk to us about what's going on in the province. So... Uh, do uh, do uh, do check for it because uh, uh, I am. Uh, this is something that I, I would want to do. Just have to make sure that we have all the logistics down. Okay, Kit Linda. All right. Um, so yeah, there we go. Uh, the other things I guess uh, is uh, municipal elections as well in Nova Scotia. There have been. Uh, it was a really interesting night uh, in that there was a lot of change. In Nova, Nova Scotia. Going into the night, uh, announcers were stating that we uh, could see as many as 14 new mayors throughout the province because um, with the number of people that were, just weren't running again or that uh, had won by acclamation, it looked like at that point that there had been 14 mayoral seats, mayor seats that would that couldn't help but change, and there might have uh, been more after that. Um, the biggest one, of course, is for Halifax, and there is a new mayor of Halifax. It is former Liberal MP Andy Fillmore, who uh, took the victory. Uh, Mike Savage, who was mayor, I believe, for 12 years, no longer is, uh, but that seat became vacant because it seems that uh, Mr. Savage has been uh, named as the new Lieutenant Governor of the province. So he's going on to take on uh, bigger duties. And uh, yeah, I think that is absolutely uh, fantastic uh, for him. Uh, Mike Savage uh, has done a lot uh, for, the, for the city. And uh, this, this seems to be a, a, a fitting progression. Um, Kitsasi says Andy Fulmore is meh. <laughs> we'll see. Some people shine at different levels, right? <laughs> Some people shine at different levels. So uh, we'll see what happens. But yes, Halifax does have uh, a new mayor. According to the CBC here, a number of incumbents went down to defeat in Saturday's municipal elections in Nova Scotia, including some high-profile mayors and a 30-year veteran of municipal politics. 
In Wolfville, Mayor Wendy Donovan lost to two-term Councillor Jody McKay. In Hammerst, two-term Mayor David Cogan was defeated by Rob Spall, who was the town's mayor from 2008 to 2015 when he decided not to reoffer. Carolyn Bolivar Getson, the president of the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, was unseated as mayor of the municipality of the District of Lunenburg. Bolivar Getson, a former provincial cabinet minister, was beaten by Elspeth McLean Weil. McLean Wilde told CBC News that early into her campaigning, she heard people say they were ready for change. Quote, I just felt that during all of the summer months, and it just kept building as the fall arrived and we approached election day. She said her first job would be working with returning and new councillors to tackle challenges in the community. Former Liberal MP Andy Fillmore will be the next mayor of Halifax, fending off challenges from his nearest rivals and a crowded field of candidates. I believe there were 16 candidates in that one, if I'm not mistaken. Um, longtime political veteran Cecil Clark staged a comeback on Saturday, retaking the mayor's office in Cape Breton Regional Municipality. He previously served as mayor from 2012 to 2020. Nine candidates were hoping to be the next mayor of the CBRM with housing and high property taxes. Common issues, they said, were priorities. Current mayor Amanda McDougall did not run again, and CBRM is uh, the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. Elections were held in nearly 50 towns and municipalities in Nova Scotia. Mayors were acclaimed in a number, including Ridgewater, Truro, and Digby, but there were mayoral races in towns such as Kenville, Antigonish, and Port Hawkesbury. Sean Cameron, one of the two candidates for mayor in Antigonish, said his views on amalgamation helped him win. Even though the province decided against an, uh, sorry, even though the province decided against an amalgam amalgamation between the town of Antigonish and the county in April, he said the topic was on the minds of voters. Quote, I don't feel I or a lot of people had enough information to make a reasonable decision, he said. There's no financial examination of pros and cons, so I think that resonated with a lot of the voters. They wanted to know more, and some of them even challenged you at the door to see what side of the fence you were on. In Kentville, Andrew Zedian was elected as mayor, defeating two other candidates. The current mayor, Sandra Snow, did not reoffer. Scott Christian is the new mayor for the region of Queen's Municipality. In the town of Shelburne, Stanley Tanny Jacklin was elected mayor and becomes the town's first black mayor. I'm overwhelmed with what's happened this evening, Jacklin told CBC News. Jacklin said he thinks voters were drawn to his integrity and ability to listen to and bring people together. He said affordable housing was the most common issue people raised with him, followed by safety and the need for more business in the community. Quote, a lot of the younger people are living with their parents because of the fact of the matter, that affordable housing is not attainable at this time. In the town of Yarmouth, Pam Mood was re-elected as mayor, and in the town of Luningburg, incumbent Jamie Myra also won. Former CAO and incumbent mayor Amory a a Boyer was re-elected in Annapolis Royal. She is joined by an all-female group of first-time councillors. So yes, kids and cubs, the town of Annapolis Royal is completely democratically governed by women. From the mayor on down. Boom. I kind of like that idea. In the municipality of the District of Guysboro, the longtime warden, Vernon Pitts, was handily defeated in District 6 by Susan Cashin. Pitts was first elected to council in 1994. Some municipalities share their results on their websites, while others relied on social media. Um, and then they have a list of uh, which, uh, which ones uh, did that in there. So, uh, yeah. That's the situation in the, in the, the region, according to Kit Saucy here. Um, Shelburne is my hometown. Tanny went to school with my father. He's a good guy. So there you go. Uh, some support for uh, the first black mayor of the town of Shelburne, Mr. Jacklin. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, Kit Lanam, was it just my impression or were there a lot of women elected? Uh, Kit Sassi might be able to provide an answer for that, but it, it, I got that impression too, Kit Linda. Uh, I got that too. Kit Sassi says that Yarmouth re-electing Pam Mood was a good choice. She has been phenomenal with building Yarmouth. There we go. What else uh, do we have here uh, from Sassi? Liberals seem to have an edge. Fillmore was a liberal, so that's a sign. There you go. Uh, Linda M., if Nova Scotia wasn't looking for universal change at the lower levels, that doesn't bode well for Houston. Yeah, good point. Good point. Uh, oh, okay. 
And the reason for which uh, Kitsasi said Andy Fillmore is meh is because Andy Fillmore suggested that people are coming to Halifax to be intentionally homeless. That would be a weird thing in my view to uh, suggest. Hmm. Not very necessary either. Very strange. All right, kids and cubs. Uh, I believe that we have a show. Um, oh, there is one other thing. I forgot to mention it. Um, there is a lot of furor, and I uh, admit that I contributed it to myself about CTV having had an interview this weekend on Question Period uh, with um, the expelled High Commissioner of India to Canada. Uh, now, he's still on Canadian soil at the time of the interview because uh, when they're expelled, they're given a couple of days to arrange their affairs. Uh, so uh, he did that. Um, I was uh, shocked that they decided to have this person on as a guest. Um, there's a DOJ, there's two DOJ indictments in the States uh, with regard to this. And, uh, you know, we have tried to have credible evidence. Uh, we have credible evidence, sorry, we have tried to present it to them. Uh, they have not been interested in it. Uh, our Five Eyes partners back us up on this. Um, it, it's, it's a serious situation. It's definitely a serious situation. And um, my first instinct, as was that of many people, is uh, why are we giving this person who all our allies and our government is telling us is a known threat to our country and is engaging in foreign interference uh, in Canada, why are we even giving him a platform in any way, shape, or form to keep the operation going? Now, it's not a choice I would have made. I did listen to the interview. I do have to credit Rashi Capellos uh, for the choices of questions that she asked. And she did press him. Uh, but you could tell. And, and the, the interview was informative in that she was able to make it very clear that uh, all the excuses that they are using um, are just, uh, it's BS. It is BS. And, um, you know, at first it's like, uh, the claim of the government of India is that the government of Canada has presented them with no evidence. Uh, and you know, when asked why are you being more cooperative with the United States because the United States does things different, we showed that clip of uh, RCMP Commissioner Michael Jan in the United States, uh, the release the unseal indictments, and there's a list of the evidence that's there in them. And so the Indian government is saying, well, you know, the, you know, the indictment is there. We know what the evidence is. We can act on it. Uh, so therefore, we're, you know, participating in Canada hasn't shown us any evidence. But nobody there seems to be available to see the evidence when we show up with it. And there always to be, seems to be some reason um, some process reason. So uh, the Indian High Commissioner said that uh, the last time it was because when Canadians were coming up to show them, uh, they asked for their visas in not enough turnaround time. So that must mean that the Canadians didn't really want to show the information. Um, now, we would have to take his word for that, and uh, he tends to uh, with, uh, lie. Um, so I'm not sure how much I would take that to the bank, but even if that was possible, uh, Ms. Capellos uh, did try to impress upon him. Yes, but given the severity of these allegations, like, why are you letting a process point like that stop you from wanting to see the information? It's like the so I can understand a nation saying you have to give us information in the format that we can use under our judicial system here. That's one thing. 
this, but so you didn't apply for a visa in the time that we have. So even though you have this really, 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 really important information that you think we should see, we are going to say no. We can't. Uh, we can't do that. Or we won't. You, know, you have to apply for the visa. You have to follow our process. Now you also mentioned other things about not knowing that the people that they needed to, to speak to would be there to talk to. Uh, and he has to make those arrangements. So, but. There's, again, some of this could be true, some of this can't be, might not be. I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, and I have no way of knowing, so I can't speculate. There's no, there's no point. But there just seems to be always an excuse. So, Vashi Capellos, I will have to say, begrudgingly, made it such that the interview was something that the average Canadian could listen to and learn from and get a sense um, that uh, reports from Canadian sources that the government of India has been less than cooperative and less than willing to actually see whatever evidence it is that we have um, is probably true. And somebody was fair-minded and watched that, uh, they would get that impression. It just seems like this is so many excuses, like why? Uh, this doesn't make sense. Um, now, uh, Kitlin says if they wanted to be balanced, they would have had a counterpoint interview immediately afterward with a Canadian representative. There was uh, an interview uh, with a Canadian representative uh, that I saw. I think it was, uh, I believe it might have been our High Commissioner to India who I think has been expelled as well. Um, I, I will double check that. But I did hear, I did hear uh, an interview uh, with someone from Canada. I don't know if it preceded, uh, if, it, uh, if the show opened with the Canadian and then the interview was saved for the end so they weren't juxtaposed one next to the other uh, during the show. Uh, that might have been the case. Uh, and I could tell you that if I had watched the show uh, from beginning to end, but I actually uh, watched both interviews as clips, so I don't know actually where they entered into the show. But from the, the manner that, uh, being familiar with the show and the manner that the segments were introduced, uh, it seems to me that uh, the interview with Canada's High Commissioner to India uh, may have opened the show, and then the, this was an extended interview. Uh, with the uh, uh, now expelled um, High Commissioner of, Can of India to Canada. Um, yes. So yes, indeed, uh, Cameron McKay is uh, Canada's High Commissioner to India. And uh, there was a, an interview with him. And uh, if, uh, hopefully, uh, if Mr. Risley is feeling better tomorrow, uh, I will be able to present that uh, segment because uh, that one... Uh, may have been uh, missed by a lot of people. Um, so yeah, uh, while I would not have uh, a CTV have done this myself, um, if I have to be completely fair, there was some actual uh, journalistic value in doing it and the questions uh, were questions that if you did have an opportunity to sit in front of this person and ask them are the questions that should have been asked. Um, but then again, when you do this, you know that the other person is going to sit in front of you and give them uh, the diplomatic media lines that uh, the government he is representing is there, uh, has fed to him. Uh, and that from his side, you're just going to get the India, the government of India propaganda line when it comes to this. Um, so yeah, it's an opportunity uh, for them to maintain the interference operation, keep it going, bring it to a broader public. Um, but it is also, um, if you're someone who's watching this that really wanted to get a sense, uh, you know, is uh, India being above board on this? Uh, I do not believe from 
his interview, if one was being fair-minded, watching with an open mind, that you would leave with the impression that um, he has been, that he is not being parsimonious with the truth would be the expression uh, I would use here mm. to uh, remain diplomatic since we're speaking about diplomacy. Um, yeah, that, 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 that uh, like I said, weird decision, the execution of it was good, so it does give some validity to the decision. There was some journalistic integrity. There was some public value of it. Um, not a decision I would have made, um, but I'm not entirely... The more I sit with it, the more I'm not entirely, not entirely mad that it was made. Because but this is a position that I get to um, admittedly begrudgingly. Because I'm uh, I'm not uh, I'm not a big fan of giving that type of platform in this particular type of situation. I mean, a Canadian citizen was murdered on our soil. And someone who is accused, uh, it would seem somewhat credibly, based on evidence that is claimed to be had, uh, had a role, either an organizing or convening role, in uh, making that happen, as well as a whole bunch of other potential crimes. Um, is not something uh, that... Uh, makes me happy so yeah i am um yeah kitlin am too bad we'll never really be able to put those people on trial here uh, in, indeed indeed uh but there are some people uh the ones who have diplomatic immunity we can't but uh, the people to whom they allegedly contracted contracted out the violence uh up to and including extrajudicial ju judicial killings on canadian soil uh, the people to whom they contracted out uh, the responsibility for committing the violence that it would appear they allegedly wanted. Uh, they will uh, be able to be tried here in Canada and held accountable. And um, the more of this... Uh, some people were making the comments and the comments similar to that which I've made is that a lot of India's position and uh, public statements are for domestic consumption back home and it is working for them back home but the other audience that is watching this going on as I mentioned repeatedly as both the fifth column calls it the international poker table at which everyone is cheating in India, especially since uh, Russia seems to be uh, arranging itself to be demoted from the table, uh, given uh, what the world seems to have learned about it. Uh, that it's maybe not as militarily powerful and economically sound as everybody thought, uh, given uh, its failure uh, in Ukraine, regardless of what happens ultimately. Uh, they didn't take it very quickly and it's become a war of attrition and Russia's had to show a lot more uh, of their cards so the world knows what it has. And uh, Russia now has uh, much more NATO along its border than it had before it started with Finland having joined. So um, strategically, pretty much anything that Russia was hoping to get from the initiative didn't happen. And the things that it said it most did not want, more NATO on its border, well, they got the opposite of it. So for all intents and purposes, one could say that they've already lost, right? Uh, but the, the war keeps going on. Um, and even if Russia does manage to get some territory and whatnot, um, you know, there's maybe a motivation to try and get, get something, secure something, so that they can say that it's not a full loss because at some point they are going to be answerable to their own people. And uh, they don't really have much to show for it right now. Uh, but if Russia gets demoted from that table, 
they're no longer considered a big player. They're starting to be considered more of a vassal state uh, associated to China because China is the bigger dog and China is already sitting at that table while there's a space that frees up. And I'm sure India would very much like to be uh, the country as the most populous country in the world and as allegedly uh, the largest, again, population-wise democracy in the world. Um, they would like a seat at that table. But there are some gatekeepers. The United States being one of them. And uh, given that the United States now has two indictments and shares the border with us, they're probably not very, very, very keen. The United States is on uh, India not cooperating with our investigation. So there's probably some other conversations going on saying, you know, if you aspire to sit at the big kid's table someday, there are things that you can and cannot do. And there are things that you must and must not do. And uh, cooperating in this case is probably one of those things that you should really strongly reconsider doing. So we'll see where that lands. But yeah, uh, it, it was it was an interesting choice. And uh, like I said, I, I can see a case um, either way. Those who uh, were appalled by that, I can see how. And those who said, nope, this is, you know, you, you, it's newsworthy. You got to bring them in. You got to put the questions to them. You got to see how they respond, how they hold up under the scrutiny. Uh, so long as the journalists that do that actually do ask the questions. And Capellos did ask the questions that needed to be asked uh, and pressed as needed. Um, so, um, you know, we get the impression that, uh, that we have, uh, which for me, in my opinion, was uh, less than impressive on the part of uh, the High Commissioner of India. Um, I am uh, less likely to, and less inclined to believe anything he says henceforth than I was before going in, after listening to that interview. So there you go. Um, we'll see how it plays out. We'll see how it plays out. But uh, yep, yeah, it's a weird, uh, Like I said, it, it, it's a weird choice. <laughs> I don't really know how else how else to frame it. But uh, as a journalist, I could see wanting that opportunity and trying to make the most of it. Uh, and again, uh, I don't always agree uh, with uh, the manner in which Vashi Capellas uh, does her work. Uh, but on this one, um, I have to admit, she did a she did a very good job. She did a very good job. Uh, you know, she yes, could she have pressed harder and all that kind of stuff? Yes. You know, there could have been more of something or less of something. But overall, the general where you set the bar, um, it was indeed a journalistic exercise, and uh, there was value from it. So, um, uh, good job, Miss Capellas. Good job. Uh, CTV, however, mm, not sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying, I know it looks like I'm trying to have it both ways like this, but I'm trying to, you know, uh, put on CTV what belongs to CTV and leave to Vashi uh, what is actually hers, uh, what, she, uh, what she's earned. Uh, um, oh, uh, Kit James asked what interview is Douglas referring to? Uh, the interview that uh, Vashi Capellas had on CTV's question period this weekend with uh, the, uh, soon to be or very soon or currently now former high commissioner of India to Canada asking about uh, uh, the recent revelations by the RCMP and a uh, second indictment from the DOJ in the United States uh, suggesting that uh, there were agents of the Indian government that were uh, uh, contracting out uh, violence in uh, both Canada and in the United States. And I believe that the UK maybe has a couple of things to say about that as well. All right, kids and cubs. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Weaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we loved making this for you. I'm so sorry for the audio stuff. I'm hoping that it, uh, it is a little clearer uh, for the podcast as well. Um, but I do thank 
for your patience uh, and your understanding today. Remember that sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless, so please tell your peeps and poops all about us. And if you would like to make sure that you do not miss a single episode, you do not have to, thanks to the Ray Girl, because she sponsors our pod page. So if you click that QR code that just appeared, that brings you to podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words and if you click subscribe there when we have something fresh off the bandwidth it comes directly to you now if you would like to support us in other ways kids and cubs well then you need to make like kit and lane and surf yourself on down to the true north eager beaver media incorporated youtube page yes where we have some buttons for you like share subscribe click one click two click three three it makes us so happy <laughs> when you do that uh so uh thank you so much and uh if you would like to support us in yet another way uh because you like the content that we produce and you would like us to encourage us to do more and think that it is worth uh, offering us a little uh, financial uh, recognition in order to help us with the costs of producing the show then uh, we ask you if you would please buy us a coffee or a hot chocolate by going to our coffee page. So if you scan the QR code that just appeared, but uh, or go to coffee, ko-fi.com slash the true north eager beaver. Sorry, no, that is not, that's incorrect. Sorry, coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And there you can make a little donation. So if uh, uh, the loonies in your toonies in your pocket are, are weighing you down, uh, we're help, more than happy to help you lighten your load. <laughs> so, uh, but anything you can contribute really does help us. Uh, we have some thank yous uh, to give out. Uh, we haven't forgotten you. Uh, just sometimes we're having some extra long shows. We're having to end them very quickly, but uh, we will. Uh, we will make sure to highlight you and have a moment and give you thanks. Uh, but do know that you do have our gratitude, and we have not forgotten you. <laughs> So uh, if you're able to donate anything, we appreciate it very much. And if you are not able to, please do not worry at all because the gift of your participation and your attention is the gift that means the most to us. And we love to hear from you. So please write to us. TrueNorthEagerBeaver at gmail.com is our email, email address. Uh, let us know what you think about the show. If you have some story ideas, we love that very much. If you want to reach us on our Twitter feed, it's at TrueEager. And uh, there again, we can be in contact. And we also have our Facebook page, True North Eager Beaver. If you go there, there's also a lovely community there. Uh, there uh, people get to have longer discussions, of course, because they're not uh, limited by 280 characters. And that's our original home on uh, all the socials. That's where our blog originated. So if you go there, uh, there's a wonderful community of uh, kits uh, that have really been uh, there for the for a long haul, there's people that have been with us for over 10 years there you know, who uh, definitely uh, understand us and have gotten to know us and uh, appreciate what we do. And uh, you will find them there if you go hang out. Um, as well, um, <laughs> you can leave us some comments here on our uh, YouTube page right below. We do try to read everything, and we thank you for uh, everything that you have, good, bad, or ugly, so long as it's constructive. We can definitely do something with it. So thank you, Kits and Cups, for all of that. Uh, let's see. So that's uh, all our socials. Because democracy is something that you do, Kits and Cubs. Uh, if you are in New Brunswick, vote, 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 vote. Very, very, very important. Uh, democracy is something that you do, and kids don't let kids vote alone. So please bring a friend with you. Uh, let's flip New Brunswick and uh, protect our Constitution. Very, very, very important that we get that done. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, like I said, uh, we'll attempt to have a return show. Uh, so starting around 9 p.m. our time, 8 p.m. Atlantic, if you're out there. Uh, we hope that you will join us. And uh, I'm not sure, like I said, if Mr. Grizzly has an ASMR. Uh, but uh, if he does, uh, I will post it on our Twitter feed and our socials uh, that he does and give you a, a time and a link to be able to join that because uh, I know that some of you really do very much appreciate what it is that uh, he has to offer on that, uh, uh, on that front. But uh, a bad back is a bad back, and I know how painful that is. So 
Uh, sometimes you just need a personal day, right? As we say on the show, you've got to be kind to and gentle with yourself. <laughs> there you go. And also because democracy is something that you do if you're in Saskatchewan, you've got about a week to go. So uh, make sure that you plan your vote. Uh, that's all very important. Um, if you are looking to vote early, I think that that is now possible in the province, if I'm not mistaken. Um, vote by mail packages requests can be made now online via elections.sk.ca slash vote by mail and by phone. Election Saskatchewan must receive your completed package before 8 p.m. on election day. Uh, I do not know if there's anything else uh, in Saskatchewan with regard to early voting, but I will check that out for you, kids and cubs, because uh, this would be um, the time that this would happen. Um, so here it says the application deadline for voting by mail and homebound voting was October 19th. A voter's only option now is to vote in person during voting week, October 22nd to 28th. So yeah, uh, not a lot of advanced uh, voting options in Saskatchewan. How uh, interesting there. So yeah, it seems that uh, if you didn't uh, do that before the 19th, uh, there doesn't seem to be any advanced polling days uh, specifically in Saskatchewan, from what I can tell. Uh, if we have any Saskatchewan listeners, uh, please correct me on that. But at the moment, that's uh, what it seems like from what I can best I can gather. All right. Yes, Kitty Lane, Douglas, 9 p.m. in New Brunswick is 8 p.m. here. Sorry. Yes, sorry. <laughs> I did the time zones backwards, didn't I? Didn't I? Oh my god, sorry, not 9 p.m., 7 p.m. Thank you, Kit Elaine. <laughs> yes, sorry, sorry, 7 p.m. Eastern if we're doing a live results show. Oh, thank you for catching that. I really appreciate that. Oh my, yes. Um, so, yes. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, Wow, uh, I can't believe I made that mistake, uh, but but I did, and, uh, and I'm glad I saw that before I signed off. Okay, um, so that's because democracy is something that you do. If you want to watch the live returns, uh, do join us around 7 p.m. tonight, uh, unless uh, there's a change, but please follow us on our Twitter feed. I will keep uh, the updates going there. Okay, um, longest sign-off in uh, Eager Beaver history, probably, <laughs> all that stuff, but... Uh, Words of wisdom, uh, kids and cubs. Um, I don't really have any because it's been a really strange part. Here, let's put it this way: uh, if it gets, if things get weird, if you're ever in a situation where things are just like really weird, not weird where you're in danger, but just weird, just sometimes stillness is your best friend. <laughs> just stand still, close your eyes, take a couple of breaths, <laughs> and just surrender to the fact that it's going to be a weird day. And then roll with it. <laughs> That's about the best I've got for you. Oh, man. All right. Uh, Mateo, my dear friend, happy birthday again to you. Thank you, Ms. Shadika, for making sure he could come on our show today. It's always a joy when we have a chance to see our uh, our uh, most favorite little man. So there you go. Six years old. That's a big deal. I remember my sixth birthday. It was pretty much a rager. <laughs> as much a rager as you can be at six. <laughs> the musical chairs got real intense. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> all right, kids and cubs. I am going to uh, wish you a most terrific day and uh, try to stick the landing because uh, the start of the show was a little shaky. But I think I will be able to stick the landing today and have a little tiny, tiny, tiny um, Easter egg for you. Some good news from the tennis world. So I'll bring that to you. You are listening to 
a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. All right, kids and cubs, this young man here, his name is Gabriel Diallo. We've uh, talked about him a few times on the show um, because he's been uh, doing a good job rising up the ranks. Well, uh, over the course of this last week, he was participating at an ATP, that's the Association of Tennis Professionals, the men's tour uh, event in a place called Almaty. Um, in Kazakhstan, and uh, there are various levels when you're playing tennis. You've got the International Tennis Federation, then you have the challenges, and then you've got events, 250s, 500s, 1000s, and then the Grand Slams, which are 2,500. So this is a 250 event, uh, but for the first time, he's reached a final on a tour event. And when he started the tournament, he was ranked 118th in the world. Along the way, he defeated the world's number 31 player and the world's number 23 player to get to the final. Uh, and during the final, he did play against a Russian-Armenian player called Padan Hakan Hakanov, uh, and he took it all the way to three sets, but did lose 6-2, 5-7, 6-3. This was Hachanov's seventh ATP Tour title, uh, but this is um, uh, Diallo's first final of a tour-level tournament. And by getting there, he rises from 118th in the world to 87th in the world, making him now the third Canadian man in the world's top 100 with the win. That is freaking awesome, which also means that when the Australian Open comes along, he won't have to qualify. He's going to get a direct entry by virtue of his own ranking. So uh, that is fantastic. Uh, our tennis players have been tearing it up the last three, four weeks with tons of wins and finals or uh, being finalists or getting to semifinals in a whole bunch of tournaments all around the world at all levels. Um, there, there's something in the water and there's a lots, of, lots of good stuff coming up. Uh, a lot of our tennis players uh, in singles and doubles right now are at career-high rankings. Uh, so um, we, have, we have a really solid program under us, and uh, there's going to be a lot of names that you're going to be hearing in, uh, in the coming months and years, Kits and Cubs. So uh, yes, as uh, Kit Dan says, go Canada, go. All right, Kits and Cubs, have a beaverific day, and uh, Hopefully, we will be seeing you a little later tonight for the new Brunswick election live results special. And until then, if you are in New Brunswick, vote, 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 vote.